there are always at least two sides to every story. Textbooks in the past have looked at our history from a European point of view. The ideas of early European settlers were not entirely accurate. For various reasons, the opinions and explanations of Aboriginal people have rarely been heard and seldom appreciated. In 1982, the New South Wales Department of Education introduced the Aboriginal Education Policy. This policy attempts to correct past inaccuracies and in teachings about Aboriginal ways of life, both before and after the invasion of the new arrivals. In the present requires an understanding of the past, because the past has shaped the present. But what do you know of the past from the Aboriginal experience? The Georges River? Well, I wouldn't drink it. It's just a lot of H2O mixed with mud and a few other things thrown in. Today, the Georges River still flows to the sea for 104 kilometres through Campbelltown, Liverpool and the Bankstown district before it reaches Botany Bay. As it flows, it passes through unspoiled bushland, past an army base, many of our homes, factories where our parents and friends may work, playing fields, golf courses, parks and under our rail and road bridges. This is the way we see the Georges River today. But it wasn't always like this. Up until 200 years ago, the people who lived here for thousands of years would have seen the river quite differently. The traditional residents and caretakers of the area around the Georges River were the Durrawal people. The Durrawal boundaries stretched from the south side of Botany Bay and Port Hacking to the north of the Shoalhaven River and inland to Campbelltown and Camden. These people were of the river and sea. Their closest neighbours were the Aurora, Gunungara and Durrock people. The Durrawal were closely linked with their surroundings. They may have managed the environment and resources to some extent, but they did not see themselves in opposition to the natural environment. Aboriginal people lived in harmony with the land. Unfortunately, few non-Aboriginal people have understood this relationship with the land. The river provided these people with their basic physical needs, such as food, water, places for shelter, rest and recreation. It also provided a reason for their existence in the world, the basis for their spirituality, that is, the dream time. For at least 40,000 years before European settlement, Aboriginal groups effectively governed themselves, had their own spiritual way of life, education, medicine, legal, socio-cultural and economic structures. Like all societies, Aboriginal people were not without their problems and concerns. Their way of life was always changing, like all societies do. This social evolution, which occurred in traditional society, would have been gradual. It remained in the control of the Aboriginal people. Durrawal people were subject to even more drastic and dramatic change. As there were no visible signs of leadership within the Durrawal community, the British did not recognise the government structure that existed. Therefore, they declared the land terra nullis, or empty continent. In many instances, when Aboriginals resisted, they were shot, poisoned and chased away. All that remains of the Durrawal society, culture and heritage are some drawings and etchings on rock surfaces around the river. The Georges River area is rich in Aboriginal sites, 
but people who now know of their location try to keep them closely guarded secrets, mainly to protect them from vandalism. I would say that the, the Aboriginal people, uh, when they first saw them, I went back to this cave and said, well, you should have seen what I saw today. I've never seen it before in my life. And with that, he took uh, his drawing materials and he drew on this wall one bull with the cloven feet turned to the side so that uh, you could see the, uh, what the footmarks would probably look like. And then at the back, he drew a cow, or we presume it is a cow. Uh, the initial intentions of some people were well-meaning. For example, Governor Macquarie established an Aboriginal school in Liverpool in 1815. But unfortunately, it had to close because many of the 24 students attending died from intestinal disease by 1822. It wasn't until the 1950s that Aboriginal children were generally permitted to attend public schools in New South Wales. Up until 1972, school principals could legally dismiss an Aboriginal child on the grounds of his or her Aboriginality, home conditions, health conditions and any community opposition. Australian history does not reveal the fact that the fencing in of the land deprived the Dharawal of their food gathering and obstructed their ability to hunt. Introduced grain and animals by Europeans thrived on what was once Dharawal land. They then took, according to their custom, what food the land had to offer. For this, men, women and children were hunted and killed indiscriminately. In 1816, Attacks on farms by Aborigines led Governor Macquarie to dispatch Captain James Wallace with three detachments of the 76th Regiment to arrest the supposed offenders. They attacked a camp near Appen at night. Fourteen Aboriginal people were killed, including Carnabiugal, who had successfully led guerrilla warfare in this area for some time. What the history books do not tell us is that besides the 14 killed, there were women and children driven over the cliff into the gorge, and the five elders who were taken captive were decapitated. Also, that the attacks on farms by the Aboriginal people were the direct result of the slaughter of an Aboriginal woman and her baby by two of MacArthur's men. The Darawal waged a heroic and admirable struggle against the invaders in order to retain sovereignty. However, their resistance was weakened because many of the people had died by 1822. The musket was more powerful than the spear. Disease, poisonings and massacre meant the decimation of the Darawal. Similar events were repeated right across this continent. While that is all in the past, Aboriginal people living today in the Liverpool and Campbelltown areas are still affected by policies made by a European-style government. By the late 1800s, government and community attitudes towards Aborigines were influenced by the belief that the Aboriginal population were a dying race. The government saw their role as protectors. Officials acting on the federal policy of protection established reserves. Missions were set up by various churches, officially segregating Aboriginals from the non-Aboriginal community. While living on the reserve or mission, Aboriginal people were quite often forcibly stopped from speaking their language and practicing their culture. This is why many Aboriginal people today do not speak their traditional language or live in a traditional manner. Aboriginal people were deprived of their way of life and were forced into an alien existence. This left them unable to support themselves. They became dependent on the government for handouts. Policies changed. Assimilation became an official policy in New South Wales in 1938. As assimilation meant the absorption of Aborigines into the wider society, certificates of exemption or dog licences were issued to the Aboriginal people who were deemed by Europeans to be sufficiently assimilated. These passports enabled Aboriginal people access to public places where Aboriginals were otherwise never allowed. 
Aboriginal people won the right to vote at the 1967 federal referendum and were technically regarded as citizens of their own country. This became a turning point in the Aboriginal struggle. 1968 marked yet another change. The integration policy replaced that of assimilation. In practice, there was little difference between these two policies. Integration allowed Aboriginal people to choose their own lifestyle. The present policy of self-determination introduced in the 1970s at both federal and state government levels recognises the right for Aboriginal people to decide their own direction and future. There is still much stereotyping of Aboriginals. You know, the trouble with Abos is that they're basically lazy. And when they're not living in humpies, they're going on walkabout. Of course, you know, when they're not doing their cave paintings. They paint their faces all funny and, and they go in for really strange corroborees. Clabos drink like fish too. So much for prejudice. Not many people are aware of the present and growing Aboriginal population within the region. Aboriginal people are moving here from all parts of New South Wales for a variety of reasons. Various community initiatives such as the Aboriginal School Support Unit, community awareness seminars and cultural camps contribute to developing a better understanding between both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people in this area. In appreciating the way in which individual people express their Aboriginality, it is important to understand the result of contact between traditional Aboriginal culture and the dominant European culture. This contact is different for each and every Aboriginal person. Despite 200 years of dramatic and imposed change, Aboriginal people, whether they be Murrays, Kuris, Guris or Nyungars, are still strong in their identity. All things change. We might not be very happy with the past, but what happens from now on is the responsibility of all Australians. Learning the lessons of the past and keeping abreast of current Aboriginal community initiatives can only enrich our future. <laughs>